and welcome. And I'm so grateful to our accessibility superheroes. So many of them in the room today. Um, and I'll just turn it over to you guys to introduce yourselves and get going. Okay. Um, I'm going to start. I'm Hannah Davidson. I am half of the Office of Campus Accessibility here at Plymouth State. Um, our office is really, really excited about UDL. Um, we see a lot of benefit um, to faculty using UDL for the students that we serve. Um, I'm gonna, in a minute, let um, Sue and Susan talk more about <coughs> UDL because we're not the experts in it, they are. Um, so that's really exciting to be working with them. Um, but I did wanna just sort of explain the connection a little bit about why we're so excited. Uh, so there's a slide up here that shows the number of students that we serve um, which as of this morning is 612. Um, so that is like 15 percent-ish maybe, doing quick maybe poor head math, um, <laughs> of, of the population of students, um, of undergraduate students at Plymouth. And um, not every single one of those uh, asks for services every semester, but, but they're all eligible to do that. Um, there, those are the folks that have disclosed that they have um, some sort of accessibility need. Um, national statistics would say that that number is probably um, about double as far as who would actually qualify for services should they choose to disclose, um, which is one of the reasons that UDL becomes so important. Um, so another Wait, reason. What did you just say? Double. Yeah. So so we have 612 students who have disclosed a learning disability or um, psychiatric or physical or who are on the autism spectrum. Um, oh, it would be double that if they disclosed. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, there's wow. a lot of, and that's that's another workshop. There's a lot of reasons yeah. to um, that people choose not to disclose to the to the accessibility office. So, um, so for all of those students who are not handing their faculty members um, an accommodation plan, a letter of accommodation, um, because they chose not to disclose, UDL can really help <coughs> reach those students as well. Um, but, but even without those students, uh, I mentioned in the beginning that I'm half of an office. So there's two people um, currently serving 612 students who um, need a little bit more support than, than maybe a typical student does. Um, so, so we're stretched pretty thin. Um, and we were joking when Sue and I were talking about this <coughs> workshop, we said, everybody should UD use UDL and then we won't have jobs anymore. And I was like, yes, do that. Like, <laughs> absolutely put us out of work. Um, because, because in reality, we would still have work to do, but the work we would be doing could be, um, I think, more valuable because we could be doing more outreach and doing more, um, like, support of people who have really, like, acute needs instead of, um, writing hundreds of accommodation letters asking for, you can flip to the next slide if you want, um, for these very, very um, common accommodations. So we, we spend an awful lot of time um, in, the, in our testing room because people need to have a quieter space for their exams or they need just a little bit of extra time. Um, so that's, you know, a, a person in a closed off room for sometimes all day. Today it was all day until I came here. Um, uh, use of computer, we can talk a lot about that and like laptop bands and things. That's just being able to take notes on your laptop or record a lecture with, with assistive technology. Um, if those practices were common, we wouldn't have to, to make exceptions. We wouldn't have to retrofit um, for, for individual students. Um, so that's really where our connection to UDL comes in. Um, and I think I'm gonna turn it over to these folks. Um, I first thing I want to say is I stole everything or borrowed everything from CAST um, because for me there they have comprehensive resources resources that are very easy for people to access to watch to listen to um, and they're extremely helpful um, and I also want to introduce Susan, because we have an expert in the room. Tell us what CAST is, Susan Shapiro, <laughs> since you happen to be here. Hi. Well, CAST is the Center for Applied Special Technology, but we try not to um, say that very much because we don't want people to think about UDL as being only technology. Um, and um, I can say more about CAST, but in essence, it's um, 
a set of clinicians um, out of Boston who many years ago were creating kind of retrofitted, to borrow your word, um, <coughs> supports and accommodations for individual learners so that they could access learning. And at some point, David Rose, one of the founders of the UDL framework said, and there's a great little video someplace where I could share this with you all. He says, you know, at some point we were realizing we've got to stop trying to change the learner. Uh, we've got to try to change the book, right? We've got to change the context and the content and the environment so that the learners can just come as they are um, and make that curriculum flexible instead of asking learners to kind of squeeze into, um, you know, not right size learning. Um, so that's what CAST is in a couple of awesome. sentences. And for the multiple people who are watching online, I'll also say that we will, um, Martha will know, we will all um, <laughs> make a resource from this event that will include uh, these folks' slides and whatever other little pieces you want to put um, in there. Um, and oh, of course, a link to CAST and stuff so that people can have the access afterwards. So Susan mentioned videos, and there are two in particular that I'd like to take time to watch. They're just a few minutes apiece. They're, um, they focus on UDL um, at the, at the post-secondary level, and also the idea of retention, um, and helping us think about retention and persistence, which has been a common theme um, around the institution. So. Mm -hmm. Learning is really a lifelong journey, and when students come to post-secondary, they're incredibly diverse. They have a wide range of strengths and weaknesses, and UDL is really about how to make that learning journey tractable for as many of those learners as possible. UDL is important because of uh, the variability that we have across learners. We often think about individuals with disabilities as individuals at the margins and that if we can develop or create uh, learning environments for those individuals at either end of the bell curve, we go a long way towards addressing the needs of everyone else in between. We've seen a, an enormous growth in interest in using UDL, ranging from individual faculty members wanting to use it to whole departments to sometimes whole institutions wanting to adopt it as an approach to really better serving the broad range of students that are on campus. It is not about faculty being the experts or administrators being the experts, but the ethos of we're all in this together. In a UDL classroom, I felt like I wasn't, you know, feeling bad because, you know, I didn't participate like another student. I was, I was more so looking at myself and trying to be my best learner. I think this is really made my learning deeper. It's different to me than lecture-based courses where I sort of hear information, think it's really interesting, but then end up forgetting it down the line. UDL is really critical for helping faculty feel like they can teach all students because it's about designing for all students from the outset. UDL is really about bringing flexibility and options into the environment by design so that students will have the resources that they need um, to make learning tractable in post-secondary environments. So when I, when I think about the data that Hannah shared, those are 612 of our students, but when I think about UDL, it's about applying access to everyone on campus. Um, so that's that's kind of why I'm excited and yeah. very excited to work with Hannah because I think, like she said, if they had an opportunity to focus more on true accommodations as opposed to trying, trying to meet all the needs of learners across the campus, um, they would be able to be more effective in their own eyes. They're extremely effective, <laughs> but, but, um, but I think we can kind of put them out of business a little bit with UDL. So, um, but anything to add on that, Susan? I'll just chime in that when you were talking, Hannah, about the number of students that you were serving and you had like two and a half people or something to serve 600 students and that if 
if curriculum was designed mm. differently, you would be able to use your time more effectively. And I wanted to interrupt you, but it was too early in the time <laughs> to, do that, um, to say, and you could be using your time to make the curriculum more flexible. Mm. And the learners, they leave with all those supports and accommodations, right? So we put those on the learners, we make it work for Megan, yeah. and then Megan graduates, and that's great. But then we're back to the beginning again, and that curriculum hasn't changed in any way. Um, but if your time was helping faculty, right, a job I always wanted to have here, right, helping faculty to um, really think about where are those, those barriers to access for learners? Where are those barriers to agency for learners, where learners really feel like they can make their own learning plan and be able to make decisions about resources, et cetera? Um, then that curriculum is better, and whoever comes here, right, yeah. has a, an ability to um, learn from that improved curriculum, right? That's that right. doesn't go away, doesn't graduate. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. And when we think about retention and persistence, curriculum always tends to pop into my mind. Um, and then I came across this video. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. And then remind me to say something about neoliberalism, which I'm sure. <laughs> no, but really, I have a comment because I was so inspired by what so you said. We know from retention research that um, we actually, when we think about retention and when we study retention, we often forget to study the classroom. But the classroom is really, really mm -hmm. critical. I mean, it's the key element in why students persist or why they don't. And UDL really offers a systematic way of looking at the persistence of all students in the classroom. That's why UDL is so critical for this issue of student persistence and institutions trying to retain their students. It offers a systematic framework to look at better supporting all students in the classroom so they can persist in a course, in a degree, and get to the next place they want to go. What were you gonna say about me? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, because what I was thinking about is I think we, because we see college so much as this like market-based thing where people are taught to kind of compete against each other in order to get a better job, credential yourself. The market's gonna be tough, and so as a result, we think about individually assisting students through this challenging time and we hope like individual students are going to make it through what is essentially kind of a sorting mechanism and when we started working at ids i, I was calling it for a while radical accessibility because i like to put radical in front of every single thing to make sense of it but when we had a student who's very ill and we were adjusting like deadlines for that student obviously like most fac many faculty would right we start realizing like, oh my God, most students get sick, but also many students get very sick. So what if everything we do for that student now, we do instead of doing for the student, we do to the program. And then you start realizing that what you're dealing with is not, in, is not looking at education individually, right? It's trying to change the community so that everybody is successful. But I almost think that kind of goes against the way so many people see college now, which is about helping an individual succeed and do everything the individual can in order to, and like even when we think about linking it back to ungrading, grades are sort of this competitive mechanism, these bell curve ideas where they sort students as opposed to this idea that everyone should be successful, every community should be built around the ethos of supporting everyone. Instead we have this kind of nasty sense of people getting exceptions like you know, that's why you get so much pushback on these accommodations, because it's like, oh, this individual somehow got a special deal, right? Yeah, exactly. And, um, well, I think that the faculty here has done a really good job to um, work with the accommodation plans we have in place and to be flexible with students. Uh, there are, you know, there are some outliers, so we'll get, we'll get pushback about things like, um, you know, a little bit of flexibility in attendance policies for somebody who's chronically ill, for example. Um, and um, and it, it trickles down even to the students. I actually met with a student today um, who we were talking about kind of what comes next, like what's next, it's a first year student, so you know they want to know what's next in the, in the flow of college. And I said, well, you should make an appointment with your success coach soon because you're gonna have to choose what classes to take. Um, and I mentioned that, that 
they would get priority registration um, because of accommodation, so they would they would be able to register just a little bit sooner than the rest of the class, not the very first day. And they were they were like, oh, like that doesn't really seem seem fair because I don't want to get special treatment, mm -hmm. like and. Um, so we had a really great conversation about it, about how it wasn't about um, how it wasn't about adjusting to, to give the student an advantage, but to level the playing field a bit. And so those are conversations I think that we need to keep having. Um, and like Susan said, some of the work we could be doing is uh, more faculty outreach, and I am doing that on a very limited <laughs> basis, though. So that's part of my affiliation with the collab. But um, I'm physically only able to be here an hour a week. Um, occasionally, we we get together to do workshops like this. Um, but we've had to ha to let a lot of the things go that we used to do, or things that we really had hopes of doing. Um, we used to have like a really lovely newsletter with sort of like professional development at your desk um, that came out. Um, we have a lot of student interest for um, working with students and changing their experience for like executive function support groups um, mm. and social groups for students on the spectrum. But, but we can't do it if we're spending all of the time like um, retrofitting the classes. So. Mm. I also want to just throw the word mm. dignity out there um, because um, I have four daughters and three of them are in college right now and one of them told me a story just last week about going my twin daughters have uh, learning disabilities, like a great version of everything that you would see, you know, yeah. on the paperwork. And um, Ruthie told me the story about going to one of her professors to ask, just to say, like, okay, here I am in this semester. I haven't said this yet. I wasn't going to try, I was trying not to, but I guess I have to. And the woman who she describes as this unapologetic, wonderful professor, brilliant woman, she just said, stop. You don't have to tell me anything to get what you need. Mm -hmm. And it made me think about just mm -hmm. how much we put kids in the position yeah. of, in order to get right-sized learning, mm -hmm. you actually have to come and like tell me about some of the things that are vulnerable, mm -hmm. probably tied to stories that are really traumatic, where you felt humiliated publicly in front of your peers. And that's not to get like great gold, right? Mm -hmm. That's just to get basic access mm -hmm. to the curriculum. And so we have a system, and it's designed to put kids in that position. And I think dignity is a word that we've got to put back into mm. this conversation. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, and when we think about access and access for all, um, because I'm in elementary ed and working with pre-service teachers, <coughs> they have limited experience to universal design for learning as they go into classrooms. They're just starting to see it and to get a feel for it. Um, the veteran teachers in the classroom, because it's a newer initiative in New Hampshire, it's also new for them. Um, so I found that it, that it helps our pre-service teacher candidates if we really focus on four certain areas. So providing all students access to information providing all students with tools for learning that are just right for that student, um, how to create a collaborative learning community. And I think that gets at that whole competitive piece. Let's get rid of Johnny's gonna do better than Susie, Susie might be right below Johnny. And as a community, how do we lift each other up? And the teacher, the pre-service candidate, is the facilitator for that to happen. Um, and then it really comes down to actionable feedback. So when I think about the ungrading workshop, um, and even the term of grade, just to dump it, it is about providing feedback in the moment of learning. Um, and when I started to think about that with our pre-service teachers, it really even changed the way that I taught adult learners because no longer do I send them off home to go try to do something on their own, perhaps have difficulty or have questions, and I'm not there. So now it truly is flipped. You know, as teachers, we've played with flipped learning environments, but when you think about universal design for learning, the learning needs to happen within the community and beyond, but it needs to be active within the community when the community is 
together. So um, that's really That's just so me. funny, though, to look at that list of things, <coughs> because I think what a lot of expectations are, like, I'm going to come here and learn about video captioning, mm -hmm. and I'm going to learn about, and I mean, I can see where that would be embedded in here, sure. but sure. really, this is all the same stuff we're always talking about, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so consistent with what we're trying to do, I think. Mm. So I, I really wanted to start with a discussion. Um, so Susan brought some bling. She brought this beautiful poster. You don't have to grab it now. Um, but it, it shows the brain and the areas of the brain that actually are lit up or engaged when these things are happening. So representation, um, if we think about representation, it's about how we're sharing our content or our course information with students. So typically at the higher end level, it's through a textbook or through a lecture. So I wanna, I wanna think about what are the potential barriers for all learners with lectures, with textbooks? Um, and perhaps what are some alternatives to that or, or things we could add to those. I'm not saying we need to throw out lectures. I'm not saying we need to throw out textbooks, but how do we make those more accessible for all learners? So, and this is where I would love to turn to our experts and, and everybody else, but what's going on and how can we make it more accessible? I'll just jump in and say because I've done I've asked that same question and I know you really well um, and I've had the awkward moment happen I'm gonna try to um, avoid that from happening by saying that what Sue is asking is not what barriers exist in learners that would make learning hard she's not asking that question she's asking the question what barriers exist in the curriculum that would make learning hard right so the good news there is that we can't change learners but we can change learning and so the barriers live in the design, um, the design is disabled, right? Not the learner. Not to take away disability, right? A person with Down syndrome so has Down syndrome. Yeah. But to take away the disabling of the learning environment that's in that interaction between the, the context and the learner. So that list of barriers lives in design, in methods, materials, strategies, and assessments, um, not in people. And that's a really big difference. Yeah. But then whenever I ask that question and somebody goes, well, I've got some English language, I'm like, well, I just want to know, I say you're wrong, so. <laughs> yeah. That made me to think of two things, and I don't want to go too off topic, but twice I've scribbled in my little notebook when you were talking about um, the social model of disability, and I don't want to go like into like in depth in any like theoretical stuff, but, um, but just to say that these um, practices in UDL are are grounded in much bigger, bigger stuff about the Which I learned at another here. workshop that you were giving him. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, yes, I'm so educated yes, yes. now. Um, so, so that's really exciting to see that connection there. Mm -hmm. um, and you said something else, but I don't remember what it was. So it when it comes back to uh, yeah, no, I mean that that's complicated stuff too about like you know identity first language exactly first, I don't first want language, but that's not stripping identity. That, that wasn't yeah. that wasn't what it is. But come, I'll come back to it if I think of it. So. Uh, but well, I mean, I automatically think from my world of, of cost, which I think is less curricular, but still fits in there, um, you know, that when students can't, like, that's why I see that, oh, this is so integrated with all those yeah. social justice <laughs> components as well, right? If you're just talking about the barrier of not being able to afford a learning material yeah. Yeah. or coming two weeks late, say, to your textbook and having to play catch up because you couldn't afford it. Yeah, or I mean, other if we're just thinking about textbooks, um, other accessibility of the textbook for everybody issues. Like, um, if you're using, I'm going to use a hypothetical example I heard this week um, of a textbook <laughs> that is out of print because it's so old that the bookstore on campus can't have it, right? They can't get it in. So you so could get it. You could get it like on Amazon or something, but that would require you have you know, uh, a means to pay for this on Amazon and not say like, use one of the support foundations uh, bookstore gift cards to buy said book. Um, 
So like, just hypothetically. Hypothetically. <laughs> like, but that kind of stuff comes up all the mm. time. Like, there's mm. an actual, whether it's cost or geography or something, like, you can't physically have the book in your hand, and that's going to put that student as a, at a deficit. Mm -hmm. um, and also, looking at it through the lens um, of being a reading specialist, yep. there's so much information in the textbooks that sometimes we provide that is not necessarily mm -hmm. relevant um, to the goals of the course. Right. So having been encouraged um, to create a OER, <laughs> it really makes you think about the design of your course. Um, and wrestle with it. What is relevant? What is critical for them to deeply understand, to be able to apply? Um, and as a result, you're creating a resource that they didn't rent and lose access to. They didn't buy and have to sell back to pay rent or buy food. It's free and they can access it years beyond their time here at the university. So right. it just, that is one way to remove a barrier in the like curriculum. I don't think I'd ever really thought about that before, but that's so true that in our, it just about any faculty member uses a textbook, they understand sort of like tacitly, they understand that there's stuff in the textbook that isn't relevant to the way they teach the course or the way they talk about their discipline. And then there's just like this assumption that learners will absorb that, right? Like, whereas like for a lot of students, you hand them a textbook for a class and they figure, okay, this is the class, right? Like they don't understand that you're actually making critical choices about what pieces you're going to really focus on, what you're gonna actually have them read, but what you're gonna talk about in class and what pieces you're gonna skip over and why you're skipping over those things. Um, I think I Pat, just, Pat Cantor just sent you some hearts on that comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, props, props. Whereas I'm thinking about how um, when you're talking about the sort of tacit or the, the expectation of a tacit yeah. understanding of how to, yeah. how to decipher a textbook, yeah. um, if, especially if you're new to academia. And that's um, a challenge for anybody. For sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. Um, Oh God, Sorry, I, I, did, I totally did that. <laughs> it's okay. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> Tell me what you were saying. <laughs> you were talking about. Um, yeah, it's hard for people who know what you know, and um, you're, like, you're making I, decisions, I panned out to making decide. choices. Hmm. Sorry, I I'm sorry, I was like trying to like, how my very first <laughs> show affinity and then I derailed your marriage. It's alright. Oh, it'll come back. It'll come back. And I, I think it must be part of the UDL thing because I know, I mean, as a person who's been studying literature for so long, I don't actually know that much about things like textbooks and everything, but now that I have a high school daughter, mm -hmm. I've come to learn a lot more. Yeah. And I'm so intrigued because she's, you know, an honor student in certain areas, and but her history textbook is such that like with my PhD roughly in early American history, I could not fathom the amount of content that was in one chapter. It was the kind of thing that if you took notes on the chapter, you would have to write down every word because every word was serious con new content, right? And I thought, obviously, like how that's organized, what visuals they use, like how they communicate this, like the most high functioning person with no issues still needs support on this and so it seems to me like I guess I'm curious about how much of that UDL thing really does suggest that when we chunk things up and break things out and focus on what matters and like do we really see massive learning gains for everybody because you know she doesn't need most accommodations, but I can't imagine, like when she just gets this thing, like a plain old mm -hmm. book full of stuff, it's useless to her, mm -hmm. you know? So it seems like a lot of things that you guys must talk about doing for a whole range of accessibility issues would serve just Well, and so much of it people, sounds like right? it's about making visible your practice, right? Like, yeah, like that's not a, that's not a, that's not a challenge that's associated with people, that's a challenge that's associated with just about every new college student, that they come in and the way that course content is being shared 
is foreign, right? Like, the, in every, and in every class, it's a little bit different. In, in disciplines, there are different approaches. And so this notion that like any of our students, certainly some come with more privilege than others, but that any of our students arrive on campus truly understanding like the context in which you're making critical choices in your classes is, it's it, when you stop and think about it, you're like, why would they know that? But we never talk about it. Like we never That's talk like about it. That's like the green thing. Yeah, you just you just no. brought. I, I remembered the thing. You there you go. Let me interrupt you. Say it. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote it down this time. Did you really want to say it? So so I think that one of those bears, like you said, um, we don't we don't share our practice, mm -hmm. right? So um, if if we're going to choose to use a, a kind of traditional textbook that's really <laughs> content dense, um, and maybe deliver the content in the form of lecture, right? Um, then, and, and maybe there are some disciplines where that, or some, some you know, departmental policies or something where that's necessary, but there's still things that, that you can do to reach everybody and to um, make that process a little bit like demystified, mm -hmm. right? Um, but, so I'm using an example of, you know, if you are lecturing and you're using PowerPoints just sharing your PowerPoints before the class. It's such a simple thing, or uploading them to whatever your learning management system is. But the barrier here comes in where um, if you're using a textbook and maybe all of the PowerPoints are just the, the teacher copy um, pre-made PowerPoints from the textbook, um, and you're gonna talk about your personal life, I mean your personal experiences as related to the content, um, and then say, um, or you know you're going to insert your own slides, but then say no, you can't have these because that's that's mine. Like that's my, like I own this knowledge. It's my intellectual property, and that's like a thing that we we come up against pretty often. Where like, mm. uh, and back to accommodations, where a teacher will provide those powerpoints, for example, if we say they have to because it's like the law mm -hmm. <laughs> because they have that accommodation, but but the other thirty people in their class can really benefit from that too. Um, mm -hmm. So, so that's another mm -hmm. barrier. I think mm -hmm. of just getting faculty to kind of rethink like what's the knowledge for and who's it's for, who it's for. And it's, the other thing that like occurred to me as you were talking too, and it, it actually like echoes back to the ungrading conversation, which is that if you're going to adopt practices that really are radical, <laughs> for <what? laughs> um, that it, the you really then have this responsibility to unpack that for students mm -hmm. because um, you know it's such a bait and switch to be like you arrive on campus and you you've learned you're learning how this is done and then you go into a class where somebody is for very good reasons changing that like challenging that paradigm or mm -hmm. trying new things but isn't really talking about why yeah. or how it's different mm -hmm. or the meaning of that that's so like when you think about that that's so unfair right. um, and I was thinking about it in terms of slides actually like so I never create present I never create slides that would be remotely useful to anybody right. because my slides are so like abstract yeah. um, and so when students ask for slides I'm like why would you want unless you let like a pretty slideshow to like right. play in the background while you study um, but when they're coming to class and they're being sort of trained by the institution, like this is how we work, and they're asking for this out of, with, you know, because they've learned that this is a good way to like scaffold and support their learning, and then to have someone, a professor who's like, oh sure, I'll give you my slides, but they're useless and they don't work the way that your other, you know, instructor's slides work, and not have a conversation about why you do that, mm -hmm. and then how do they, how do they then, um, approach the lecture that I'm giving when I'm not using the traditional um, tool that they're, they're, they're being trained to kind of expect yeah. and use. And you know, and we give um, faculty advice about that too, you know, because yeah. there are people who don't use slides at all, right. or um, I, I definitely don't, um, yeah. but they don't use slides at all, or they're, they're really pretty and abstract and not really, not like really. content rich. Like, yeah. But um, I don't know why this is. This is a, <laughs> Right. We always put um, content in quotes. Yeah, right. I think I this is like yeah. required. Yeah. Content, um, so, um, <coughs> we would suggest that that the faculty member at least you know 
give the student some kind of outline. like an outline, or even it, you know, you don't. Even not something yeah. that's necessarily that time consuming, but be like, hey, we're gonna talk about these four things yes. today. Like, structure your notes around. Yeah, this. like think about this. Yeah. Whenever I mention this, yeah. or let me like record the lecture yeah. and go back later. And, yeah. Um, Is there a but, sense that like you're giving away the like? Yes. Yes. There's yes. a sense that like you're you're helping them too much if you give yeah. them that. Is that? Part of there's what, the pushback you get from that people. is one of the things is it's that or or that <laughs> that they they're their power like right their yes power. that also so, sounds like yeah. ownership yeah sorry Kathy well I, I was gonna say it, it reminds me of I just so Elizabeth Johnston and I bring our two tackling a wicked problem classes together every Friday and so we had a, a panel this Friday and an expert panel talking about climate change and um, we ask them to each introduce themselves. And so the first one introduces them, himself and um, Elizabeth and I are like jotting down all these useful things that, that he was saying. And Elizabeth said to the class after he was done, this might be a time when you guys wanna like jot down some notes. And immediately they all took out notebooks and laptops and stuff. It's like it didn't even occur to them until, and, until somebody mm -hmm. said it. And it just feels like we often assume students know how to do this yeah. and know what the point yeah. of everything is and that and that they're doing badly if they don't like yeah, that they've made a decision so yeah. to underachieve if yeah. they don't so take I, I just feel like it's our responsibility to teach them those things yeah. right Th to say when I write something on the board it's because I think it's important mm -hmm. and so therefore you should do X Y and Z with, right. with yeah. that thing and, and right. with, the, with the hope that over time that becomes exactly. then a natural skill that yeah. they develop, not that like, you know, I mean, it's fine to complete, continue to reinforce it, but you do hope that, that they start to pick up those signals and sort of be able to navigate that when they're in situations where maybe somebody isn't signaling yeah. that very clearly. Right. I just want to add the word agency, right? Mm -hmm. So we talk a lot in UDL about access, right? And access can be cognitive access, emotional access, physical access, so much around um, how uh, socioeconomic access, like how people can access learning. But within that, we have to also support learners to have agency. Mm -hmm. And I would say, like I agree with you, we have to give, teach learners, um, how to notice those critical moments and to take that kind of main idea, kind of uh, information. But we also have to give learners power to do that. And I think that's where we hesitate sometimes in actually turning that agency over to learners. So we set the due date, right? We set the resource list. We tell you how many note cards you need. We say, you know, how you're gonna do it in this group or that group and how it's gonna be assessed and what the criteria for success are. But then we wonder, right, yeah. why you don't have much agency. So mm -hmm. I think that, that's, that those are two words that can kind of help us think about UDL, which is like yes. access and then really building agency. Mm -hmm. um, and that's literally how I think about open education. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm really thinking, um, folks, that we should, like one of the things we did at the CPLC, and we understood it to be like super emergent, so we didn't make any promise that this was going to be it, but we put some sort of framing pedagogies to help people understand besides the kind of instrumental like OER-ness, project-based stuff, we kind of said here's the schools of thought. Mm -hmm. I think we should move UDL up in there mm -hmm. maybe as one of the, like when we look at that kind of connectedness and whatever else, we should think about putting that in the front mm -hmm. of the CPLC for next time because mm -hmm. this well, as, as a connection to, since, uh, you know, always thinking about Gen Ed, because one of our habits of mind is self-regulated learning, like, mm -hmm. how do you get students to have that sense of agency? And if you're not using UD, UDL, it is harder, right? It's just right. harder to yeah. do that. And so also, that, like, it's a great way of talking about agency, but keeping institutional responsibility mm -hmm. at the core, right? So that you're not kind of foisting it out on students right, like exactly. hope you can yeah. do it by like yeah. claiming your power you know I even love thinking it. about the climate panel that you had if i think about representation and how are we sharing knowledge with students or content that's a great example of it could have been an article it could have been a video and you added a panel so they're receiving information in a variety of formats mm -hmm. Um, and I'm wondering, just thinking ahead to next semester, if that happened again, 
um, the act of recording it. Mm -hmm. So they can go back and perhaps they were just so engaged mm -hmm. in what was happening by having a recording later, then they could go right. back and they could tailor the notes based on perhaps their own individual research. So, um, but being able to access and access again and access again, mm -hmm. kind of thinking about it as a reading specialist again, rereading, reviewing, pausing, thinking, jotting, okay, let me start it again. So, Mm -hmm. And thinking about that as Emma and Ruthie's mom, and they are fine with me talking about them publicly on live stream because they are <laughs> big advocates for this. Um, Emma's teacher came up to me one time when she was in middle school and said, she asked me the same question every time we have like a lecture or a film. She says, do you want me to take notes or listen? And she goes, what does she mean by that? And you know, what we know about kids with language-based learning disabilities, right? So they can do one language thing at a time. Mm -hmm. But she was just kind of innocently saying, do you think I should watch the movie or take notes? Mm -hmm. Right, because I can't do both. Yeah. And so that way- I've had a lot of students say that to me over the years. That's so interesting. It's a good question, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So that, that made me think of it, that video piece, that yeah. now she can like listen and yeah. then she can go back yep. and take notes to study for an exam. I'm not even going to mention the soft, the secret, so secret accommodation soft. software that Hannah has that I told my daughter about the other day and we agreed yeah. everyone should have it. It's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, Why don't you just say the yeah, name I'll of it? it? I'm just like, saying I wish secret because Lindsay, Lindsay was here because she's like, she's our like solicit queen. Um, so solicit is what it's called. Uh, so what is it? Solicit. S O N O C E N T. Um, it's a, a British company. Uh, when you sign up for it, you get a lovely British person um, on the phone. Oh, <laughs> I thought you got a lovely well, British person. Yeah, like, lovely British person. No, they, they really are. It was like the best um, like marketing thing that I've experienced. <laughs> uh, but so, so the software is great because um, it's a recording software that you can use on your laptop or on your phone, oh, yeah. um, and you know the, it'll sync from your laptop to your phone. So if you have a class where you're not comfortable maybe because it's not common practice for you to have your laptop in front of you, you can just more subtly have your phone and it can sync to your laptop. <coughs> and then in the laptop screen, um, for each class you go to, um, this is particularly helpful in like big lecture-based classes, you create a new project. Um, and so it records the lecture, then as it's recording, if your teacher starts going on and on about what they did last weekend, um, you could just hit a button and it'll change the color of that speech to like not important. Um, but then if they say, this is gonna be on the test, you could change the color, you could just tap a button and it'll, mm -hmm. it'll change it to like really, really super important. So when you go back, you don't have to listen to this whole two hour lecture, you could just listen to mm -hmm. the stuff that you learned that you've tapped. read or whatever you're- And explain to me is. who doesn't want that. Like right. forget about, so you know, we, so we have, the reason I was saying it's a secret is because we have limited subscriptions limited to serve only certain yeah. students. Oh, oh. But, um, but I was just like, in terms of me going to conferences or whatever, like anything, I yes. it was so just amazing. Right now, and you can we take notes can in only there. provide that for a limited number of students who have a, a, a documented language-based learning disability. So there's, there's layers to that too. You have obviously lots of people would benefit it, but benefit from it, but in order to even have a language-based learning disability documented, you had to have had you know, the privilege of being in the school system that's mm -hmm. gonna catch that, or if parents none of that, that parents were gonna cough up $3,000 yeah. for a psychoeducational evaluation outside of the school. Um, I have like a, a license for it because we were, you know, we were testing it in our office, and it was, I used it in my, um, in a doctoral class, and it was so mm -hmm. helpful because I was so overwhelmed that I thought, I don't, have a language based learning disability. I have like you know some cognitive stuff, but it's not doesn't doesn't manifest as, as a language based learning disability. Um, but I got so much more out of the class from doing that. And the the other the other big part that's really cool about it is that um, again those lecture based courses that often are a person in front of the room with a PowerPoint show but show slideshow behind them. Um, if if the the teacher does put their PowerPoints on the learning management system, then prior to class, you can upload those PowerPoints into your project, and each time they flip the slide, you can just like push a button, and so so the recording will be lined up with that with that slide, which is very cool. And then you can put another panel in there and take your own notes. Like, it's so great. I'm um, so every student that has that. Yes. Because people who walk around we want everyone to develop So somebody needs to buy a <laughs> site license and we can just give it to everybody. Um, 
So I'm not sure how to make that happen, but yeah. That would be <laughs> amazing. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. humbling though too, right? You realize if you saw your own recording, how much I kids were like watch. purple, 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 like I would so make much it my off goal task. to be like <laughs> she's off topic. She's yeah. off topic. Again. No, I'd be like, why can't let's she stay purple this up. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. That's really yeah, great. I'm really gonna write great. that down at yeah. least. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. But it's also can you as a I'm sorry, no, but can in with that tool, can instructors go and see like is there a way? Because it would be interesting too as an instructor to be like. Why did they think that wasn't important? You know what I mean? Like, because it would tell you something about like the unspoken like conversation you're having with your students. Yeah. Where no, I don't, I don't think so. I think yeah. they just really it's, maintain yeah. ownership. Like, sure, yeah. but it'd be a cool study. It would. Like, compare. Yeah, it'd be cool if students have the option to, to of share anonymously that sharing yeah. what they think is yes. important. Yes. And, um, because actually, I know for my daughter, that's a big issue yeah. is identifying absolutely what's I think, important. Like yeah. that's just the key problem she has. Is it's like, how do you know? And actually, I think it's the key problem that the teachers have. Is actually, they think that's, I think think that's true. The textbook, yeah. 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 Yes. Right. I mean, I think that's why it would be so interesting, because I think a lot of instructors, if they had to look at that, would go, oh, yeah. well, yeah. what is the important thing that right. I want them to... Yeah. Right. Or uh, Some would just be like, the, it's all important. Sorry. Sure. Sorry. Like, back to assumptions that, that teachers make yes. about students being able to kind of, like, read what what the teacher believes is important by their intonation or like by what they're writing on the board. So then if you throw in like social pragmatic issues, like you're not gonna know that this teacher gets really enthusiastic when they talk about this topic and therefore probably we're gonna be assessed on it or at least be in their good graces if we can talk about it in a paper, that kind of thing. Um, so, so yeah, that's again, more transparency and practices I think is a big part of and as you said, Robin, who wouldn't want that, mm -hmm. right? And we could think of a hundred different uh, scenarios where a learner would be be uh, benefited by that very thing, but not all for the same reason, mm -hmm. right? right? So an English language learner who doesn't understand the dialect yes. of this, right, wouldn't be able to maybe hide, you know, hear those tone changes. Somebody who's caring for an ill parent who just has to like really focus on the primary stuff and can't listen to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So many, so I love that sentence. Who wouldn't want this, right? Mm -hmm. That should be maybe what we use as like the rubric for our own design stuff, right? Mm -hmm. If we think that only one person might need this, maybe we need to design a little deeper, mm -hmm. right? To say, you know, who wouldn't want this piece? Mm -hmm. What's necessary for one is good for all is mm -hmm. one of those little like bumper stickers mm -hmm. at UDL, but I think it's a nice sentence. Mm -hmm. um, because there's lots of reasons why um, people may want um, a different option for how to, to access learning. So thinking about the green, <laughs> thinking about that um, the green area, um, when I when I was on my way in um, and I ran into Robin, I said, you know, at the at the ungrading workshop, when I heard Kathy describe um, her gaming course or that involves gaming. I heard UDL all throughout, um, and one of the one of the big threads that was in there, students had choice about how um, how they were learning, what they were accessing, how and when they were accessing it, and then even to get into the orange a little bit, how to demonstrate new learning or how to apply that learning. So I was going to ask Kathy to share a little bit about the design of your course. Um, so really when I designed it, it had nothing to do with this, <laughs> right? It was, it was because, um, I don't know, I was thinking about, I was primarily thinking about exams and how dissatisfied I am with exams in most situations, but some students love them, so I wanted to allow, allow exams to be part of the course. So the first semester when I switched the way I taught the course, I had a bunch of different assignments and students could pick and choose and they had to get a certain number of points and they could revisit various learning outcomes by doing something else related to that, which you know is kind of a nice benefit. Um, but I also added a piece, and this is 10 years ago now, I added a piece that said, if there's something that you think you wanna do that isn't in this list, come talk to me about it and let's write it up. And so now part of the course is a bunch of student designed activities that, that people can, students can choose from. Um, the only thing that's 
sort of required, I mean it's not required, but because it's worth so many points, is a group project where they actually design a game of their own. But the rest of it, they, they um, develop a strategy at the beginning of the semester, so they read through all the different options, they develop a strategy. If they don't stick to the strategy, we just talk about it and they can, they can change it. Um, I don't know what else, what else you're interested well, in. I think that's one of the main points is they have a voice. They're heavily involved in the decision-making process. So when I think of UDL and agency, to me, that's what it's all about. They, they are the learner, but they need to be involved in the decisions about how are we going to learn? What are we gonna learn? Why are we gonna learn that? How am I gonna apply this? What does it matter to me 10 years from now? They all need to be involved in those conversations. So when I heard you describing that, it's like, oh my gosh, that's, that's it. And my, my favorite part is that they get to design their own experiences if they want to. And I don't always have students who do that, but now there's, there's a much wider variety of activities that they can engage in because we work together to write it up as an assignment so that everybody that semester can do that but then it becomes a permanent part of the class, whatever the activity is. It sounds like you, um, just to piggyback a little bit, to clarify two words, uh, variety and choice. So it sounds like your learners have real choice, right? It's not, we do a variety of activities as a way of learning about ecosystems, right? Like, learners have choice about mm -hmm. how they're gonna learn about ecosystems, and that's a real difference. Um, so I just wanted to play that <laughs> into the tape. <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to put together, because like in, in open, when I'm linking access to agency, I usually do that through social justice, right? So I say, it's a, it's a social justice issue whether or not you have access to knowledge, but it's also a social justice issue who gets to determine what becomes new knowledge, who gets to shape the world, who gets to make the transformation. So I'm trying to understand in UDL, which does also have like a social justice bent, I think for sure, but I'm trying to understand UDL, how do you guys talk about the link between access, like I see here, they, they need agency, they need choice. What do you say is the why? Like why do they need that? I'm pretty sure they do, I'm like, you don't have to sell me, but what do you say? Yeah, um, expert learning. So uh, you could use a, you could think of a different word there, but we use that term. Um, so I don't know these statistics off the top of my head, but we've all heard them a million times. Learners will have X number of careers in their lives, they'll have so many jobs, they'll do jobs that haven't been created yet, all that. So we know that learners have to be expert at learning. Um, and there's no, nothing that we can fill them up with that doesn't have an expiration date in some way. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the work when I was at Plymouth that we were doing and you were leading around gen ed with like critical thinking and some of those things that are so transferable. So the why of UDL is expert learning. And when you look at the guidelines, um, the bottom row um, in the current iteration, it says we want learners who are purposeful and motivated resourceful and knowledgeable, strategic and goal-directed. And if we design in a certain way with that in mind, we're gonna give them opportunity to, and I know it sounds cliche, but voice and choice is a, is a great little way of thinking about it in a sound bite, right? Mm -hmm. We're gonna give them um, like to their own voice in learning and real choice about how they learn. Um, so that's the why, mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of what we're building toward. Which is why you said, oh, it's the habits of mind. <laughs> like so many of yeah. these things, right? Yeah, I think this is going to be really helpful to yeah, us. As I think we, so too. Voice and choice is like in project-based learning as well, right? Yeah. I mean, that's I mean part of it. Yeah. it does suggest maybe we're onto yeah. something, <laughs> folks, yeah. like that it's all yeah. cohering. Yeah. All these things that we respect so much from all these different areas have fundamentally similar principles yeah. about access, access mm -hmm. and agency. Yeah, I agree. It's really yeah. at the core of so many of these things. Yep. And I think I know why. Because you put Close learning, up. you put learning in front of teaching. Mm -hmm. You know, when you made the decision. Thank you, Mary Cornish, for <laughs> yes, telling absolutely. us to change the name of the I Open Code. Yeah. Why did it change? Was it originally? It, it originally was like, teaching. Um, yeah. Like, originally, no. Well, okay. Yeah. I don't really <laughs> okay. Why? I kept originally, it didn't have teaching at all, <laughs> and I was told that we were 
had to be a teaching and learning center, so I put it back in, and then Mary Cornish came up with the great idea of just reversing those it's, to make a it's make a the inflection very obvious. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we were originally the bl 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 learning lab, you know, but <laughs> we have like to go this little on. design choice totally impacted. Oh, right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> okay, and so moving into the orange, um, we just had the ungrading workshop, um, but thinking about how we currently assess learners. Um, and we really didn't have enough time to talk about the difference between praise and feedback, yeah. <clears throat> actionable feedback. So in our world, in the, in the education programs, it's critical for us that our students deeply understand what the difference is. Um, that word not, actionable is so helpful, yeah, is really honestly, helpful. because yeah. you can't really have actionable praise. So, yeah. 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 and that whole idea of actionable feedback is formative. I am giving you feedback or I'm providing a question to help you consider how can I move forward toward this goal that we have mutually agreed upon um, or developed together in Kathy's case? But that feedback needs to be timely, it needs to be tailored, and it needs to be actionable. So praise is none of that. Praise is, there's a cartoon I should have put in here. If there's a dog walking by and he says, damn it, good dog. When am I ever gonna be a great dog? Because <laughs> like, it's just, it's so abstract. Like, and what did I do to be good? Did I run fast? Did I catch the Frisbee? Why was I good? Um, and it's the same thing with children, with adult learners. So feedback has to be specific and has to help the learner toward reaching their goals. Um, so just kind of thinking about assessment. So when I think about exams, I think of those kind of more as summative toward the end, mm -hmm. and the, the actionable feedback might be leading up to that mm -hmm. and having multiple ways to demonstrate understanding. But what do you think, expert over there? <laughs> no, I'm not an expert. <laughs> um, but I would just add to that, that and giving learners as much descriptive feedback as possible so learners can give themselves that feedback. So this is a silly example, but I could say to a young child, like a two-year-old, um, wow, you're a fast runner, right? Or I could say, I just looked over here at Hannah, and then I looked over there at the water cooler, and you're all the way across the room. And the child says, me a fast runner, <laughs> right? So how do we give learners feedback where they can say those sentences to themselves, right? Yeah. I did a great job on this paper, right? Mm -hmm. I, like, I, I, and so we're giving them descriptive feedback again. To, yeah, so that the agency mm -hmm. and that per even assessment mm -hmm. lives with the learner. And even um, with teacher candidates, something else, um, something else that we do, we'll try to give them real clear examples of um, if you are just giving praise, and then that shift to if if a learner um, just met a goal, even if it was a small goal leading up to a big goal, to say to that learner, how do you feel about it? <coughs> How do you feel on the inside? Because it's getting at that intrinsic rather than the extrinsic award reward as well. Um, and then having identifiable, identifiable checkpoints along the way where, um, and I want to connect back to Matt. Um, you weren't here for this, but it was an awesome workshop. Matt had a workshop where he developed um, a visual syllabus and also community-based, so the, the students had input in that syllabi along the way. But being able to determine those checkpoints ahead of time and being able to ask questions along the way. And I go back to, too, when students walk into the room or learners walk into the room, it kind of shouldn't be a mystery of what you're doing that day. Um, so connecting back to Matt and um, having something visual there. I remember right before you left, um, you had shared visual syllabi. I, 
that that changed everything using a visual syllabus um, because as an instructor it also made me really decide mm -hmm. what is critical how am I going to represent that? I read That's your literally tweet. what I just said like an hour ago on Twitter. Yeah, right now. Martha just put it out on Twitter like um, just an hour or two ago, thinking about visuals. But and when I think about it as a reading specialist, if you're using visuals or infographics, you have to take a lot of information and synthesize it. That act of synthesizing is is would be a benefit for learners, because you, you've made a decision now. This is critical. So that makes me wonder, <laughs> do we need to have our learners involved in synthesizing information into a visual, and would that represent new information um, for future learners? Um, would anybody like to plug any There's upcoming a events? <laughs> <laughs> and on October 17th. From 3 to 4.30. In the collab, if you're not here live, perhaps it will be live streamed. It's I'm called so glad you said that. Artful Pedagogy. Artful yeah. Pedagogy, yeah. Very yeah, cool. And yeah, like it really, like when I started doing visual syllabi, that's when I. There are no creative constraints that we hold ourselves to with syllabus for the most part. We're just like, dump that in. Now add this paragraph. And they just get longer and longer and longer. And then you end up with a 20 page syllabus. When you create a visual syllabi, if you actually are trying to practice that, you have to make choices, you have to make critical choices. And that's really interesting when it's your syllabus. And then having your students do work where they're having to make those kinds of choices as well. Yes, that would be my plug. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say one quick thing, just um, to related to some of the things that have been said. Um, we've been talking about choice and designing options in learning, but I wanna just highlight that in the UDL framework, it's not just, um, I don't just put out a whole bunch of gluten-free tortillas on the buffet just because I want to have lots of choices. I put those mm -hmm. out there because I anticipate a barrier in my menu, right? Mm -hmm. I anticipate that having only one kind of tortillas is going to be limiting to the people coming to my house for dinner. Mm -hmm. And so the options that I design are to remove barriers that I anticipate. Mm -hmm. And I used to say to when I was working in pre-service teacher education, you know, how is the lesson going to go? And the teacher would often say, well, I don't know, you know, I haven't taught it yet. I'm like, just pause. You know the class, right? How is it going to go, right? If somebody gave you so sub plans for your class, you could predict pretty care pretty well, detailed, how it's going to go. And so in that prediction, in that pausing to anticipate those barriers, um, to see those, um, then we design options into the, into the learning design to remove those so that learners don't have to go through Boredom, frustration, anxiety, tension, failure, senses of failure, perceptions, um, in order to get what they need. So I just wanted to say that it's not just choice for like mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. circus fun, right? Mm -hmm. It's choice really tied strategically to the removal yeah. of barriers in that curriculum, mm -hmm. in that design. Yeah. Purposeful choice. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. What did you say? Purposeful choice. Purposeful mm -hmm. choice. Right. Um, I just want to extend your, your uh, gluten-free tortilla metaphor a little bit or connect it back to, to, um, to the classroom stuff. So what are the uh, pieces of, of feedback we might, might get from faculty is like UDL, this is another acronym, this is another thing. Um, you know, in the K-12 world, it's really, I think, pretty common and well known. I see a lot of stuff that we're starting to incorporate here um, happening by, by some school, so that's probably awesome. But, um, so, um, uh, but some faculty will say it's another thing, and I know time is more work. And I just want to point out that um, a little bit of front end UDL work in the beginning is actually mm -hmm. way less work for folks because instead of trying to remember, okay, you know, in my intro to zoology or whatever class it is, um, I have to send, I have to email five students before class copies of my lecture notes, and I also need to remember that um, you know, this other student needs to have a separate space for their exam, and I wonder if I'm gonna remember to book that room in time, and things like that. Um, and I'm thinking about the tortillas, <laughs> back to the tortillas, <laughs> and if you anticipate those, those barriers um, you, and, and make the barriers go away, you're gonna have to like do less prep work, do less individualizing, so instead of making you know, a vegetarian taco filling and a mm -hmm. carnivorous taco <laughs> filling and 
one that has no soy products and one that has no gluten products, you can just make one that would accommodate everybody and and you're doing less work and enjoying your party. Basically, party the party cook vegan from the beginning. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> UDL, vegan yes. from the beginning. Yes. Uh, yeah. um, I am sensitive to time and also potentially phone battery, so <laughs> I'll turn it back over to Sue to see where so, we are. So, thinking about next steps, because this was wonderful and I love the discussion, um, but I don't want it to stop here. Um, so I'm trying to think about what would be most helpful for faculty. And when I think about the course that a lot of people are teaching is tackling a wicked problem. Mm -hmm. So thinking about what are the potential barriers, even something as simple as supporting students as they learn how to collaborate at the post-secondary mm -hmm. level and what that looks like. Um, honestly, they may not have had a lot of experience with that, and I wonder if there's assumptions around students being able to collaborate effectively, mm -hmm. and if there are things we can anticipate or perhaps scaffolds we can put in place that become part of the curriculum. Not to support individual students, but it becomes part of the curriculum to support them as they speak with others, as they listen actively with others. Um, you know, another area might be note-taking. What does that look like? And I think about um, when students are, say they're viewing something ahead of time, even, even showing them how to think mm -hmm. about certain texts in a certain way, if there's a historical event, when I'm taking notes, I'm not taking mm. necessarily an outline, mm. but I'm actually, this is how your brain would see cause and effects if there was an event. Mm. So should I be taking notes that mm -hmm. way? And if that's the case, that's something we can show you mm -hmm. and you can create on your own and your brain starts to merge these together. We can show you how that works. But again, thinking about tackling a wicked problem as process oriented as opposed to product. So if we truly believe that, how can we support learners with the process of learning that they can then go beyond that first year of school and keep going with those strategies? Mm -hmm. I, I think our next step is to get faculty to all understand that the course is a process-oriented course, <laughs> which we're working on. I mean right. that that is, but right. I mean that has been a real challenge. I think um, naming this a little more explicitly in the CPLC will be a good start. I think so and, too. Um, I'm really thinking about November. We have a very short um, group meetup, which includes our tackling a wicked problem faculty, those sort of first year fac experience faculty and a bunch of other people engaged in this learning community. We had already been talking about doing some kind of basic, you know, just a shorthand at classroom management stuff for people who are struggling to kind of create the arc of a class a little bit, especially in more open learning environments or environments, I think especially where students have agency and choice. How do you build around that in a way that's not just like, what are we talking about now? Yeah, right. Both over the course of the semester, but in a single class as well. Right. But there'd be some really great ways, I think, to potentially yep. tie this stuff in mm -hmm. with a little bit of activity about that, and maybe also beta tests with that group. What do you think about UDL as one of the models we pull forward and thinking a little bit more about these words, access and agency, as framing words mm -hmm. for our next year's cohort, because I think they might be the two words. Actually, I think they are the two words that I pulled out they for, a, I, I don't know, like I think yeah. I have actually pulled those two words. <laughs> yeah. So I think yeah. um, we can look at the particular things that we're talking about through this framework. That might be a place to start and a way of also kind of pulling you a little bit more forward because actually, we, you know, we all, everyone in this room actually kind of already knows a little bit about this stuff. For others, I think that accessibility piece, you know, we were shorthanding it here a lot, but yeah. for others, we might want to keep yeah. that even more. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, I'm thinking that's one next step would be that November event mm -hmm. and then redesigning um, the fall cohort a little bit more 
this will help because we were a little bit floundering trying to find, oh, it comes from here, it comes from there, and you know, this mm -hmm. brings a lot of things together. I would just add as a potential next step, not knowing the context of your goal, um, is to for this group to dig a little bit into the neuroscience. So I think that sometimes UDL mm -hmm. is like another kind of model, right? Oh, here's a model that we could think about. Um, but I, silly example, but you know, if I was having my gallbladder out and I heard the surgeon in the hallway say, <laughs> geez Louise, there's a new scientific study on how to get the gallbladder out. You know what, it's one more thing. I'm not gonna bother with that, right? <laughs> right. Just like, it, it comes around, goes around, all these right. strategies. Too many moves. I want to leave that hospital, right? And I feel like there is also that ethical responsibility that because of the research that we have on the brain and how the brain learns, because we know and someone has stepped that research out into a framework for educators, it, it's why I left a great job that I love to go work for CAS because it's like I, that's really like the, the edge of what we understand about learning. And it's not the end of what we understand, but I think it's the edge right now um, and it's the science of learning. So to me, there's some piece in that that's fun I think to that's dig into. that's very helpful. And we could pull his Well, I was going to say, we, book. we yeah. Um, we, we how have, Humans uh, Learn. You probably know this book, Joshua Eiler's How Human Learn. Oh, I've heard of it. Yeah. You'll love it. So, okay. so uh, maybe for the next CPLC, that can be more of a focus. We could pull and, a chapter yep, and have a exactly. reading. Um, and I think you'll like that book because it makes that um, sort of scientific uh, approach to learning, it it's, interprets that for pedagogues, basically. Right, so, application. yeah, it's about yeah. Well, how, yeah. how how does this matter to you yeah. as a teacher? Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. what it was the framework. And yeah. I think if we went, if we had a chapter from that book and a chapter from Creating Wicked Students, which is much more, which takes those same concepts and are, is much more it's instrumental right, yeah. about it, and that will help people kind of both get the bigger picture but also the concrete stuff and, and make those connections. And maybe you should come in <laughs> too, like at some point. I mean, this is Everybody really helpful. I, live um, stuff. I think, you know, people would also like to have some q and mm -hmm. I think, about this stuff. Um, does anyone else want to say anything before I say goodbye to our online viewers? You can come see me in the collab on Friday from 9 to 10 and talk about access and agency and anything else. <laughs> I'm sure that'll be especially helpful to our uh, folks from the Middle East who are yes. currently joining. <laughs> Definitely. Come you can come really. too. Come talk to me. We can, we can tweet about it. Um, cool. I'm going to stop this broadcast and just a reminder to everyone that we will share all of these resources online at the Collab website.